Beneath the oceans of the world lie countless shipwrecks, time capsules waiting to be discovered and explored. Investigating a story of mutiny, murder and madness, a team of maritime archaeologists are in search of Batavia's bones. Off the west coast of Australia, these are the remote and treacherous reefs of the Abrolhos Islands. Today, the scene of an extraordinary investigation into one of the world's most brutal mass murders. The victims from a shipwreck that took place nearly 400 years ago. Of all the dramas of the sea, the story of the Batavia is probably one of the most dramatic. The number of people who were killed, the way in which the mutiny evolved, the survivors stuck on a tiny coral island with no cover, nowhere to hide, for weeks and weeks on end with a, a gang of bloodthirsty thugs who were as likely to kill you as look at you. And really, although this was pretty much the first page in the history of Australia, it's all, even now it's also the bloodiest. You've got mutinies, you've got people with their hands chopped off, you've got people that, are, that obviously died in very... Um, um, very dramatic circumstances. The investigation into the gruesome story of the Batavia spans the globe. In the Abrolhos Islands, Jeremy Green of the Western Australian Maritime Museum is unearthing evidence of brutal murder. While in the Netherlands, historian and author Mike Dash is searching archives for clues to a remarkable story which begins in Amsterdam in the year 1628. It was a time of religious, political and social upheaval. The Netherlands was embroiled in the ongoing conflict of the Reformation and anti-papist movements. To the early 17th century Dutch, trade was all important, in particular with the Spice Islands of the Far East. The company that had come to embody maritime and merchant power was the United East India Company, or BOC. In 1628, the VOC launched a major new ship. It was the pride of the fleet and was called the Tavia, named after the company's prized possession, a major trading settlement in Java, better known today as Jakarta in Indonesia. In late October 1628, the Batavia set sail from Amsterdam with a fleet of company ships and began the long and hazardous journey to the East Indies. In the Dutch archives, historian Mike Dash examines a crucial document, a journal compiled by the Batavia's commander, Francisco Pelsart. Pelsart's journals, which are the main source, have been published in both English and Dutch, um, and they're really quite a detailed source. They run to well over 50 pages of print. At this time, um, Dutch East Indiamen were, in many respects, the most complex machines that had ever been built, certainly in Western Europe. They were the pinnacle of um, contemporary technology, the equivalent of spacecraft today. But at the same time, they were really highly uncomfortable vessels on which to make a very long voyage. And they would sail at a maximum of about four miles an hour and a normal speed of two and a half miles an hour. So you were effectively travelling at less than walking pace for a period of between six and nine months. On board the Batavia were well over 300 souls. A mix of sailors, soldiers, VOC company officials and a number of passengers. The Batavia was a retour ship, uh, a ship that the uh, Dutch East India Company called uh, vessels that were going backwards and forwards from the Netherlands to Batavia. She carried a fortune in coins contained in 12 chests worth over 30 million dollars in today's money. Commander Pelsart was a veteran of nine years in the East Indies. He'd had a bad relationship with the skipper Arian Jacobs. They'd fallen out on their voyage back in 1627. Third in command was under merchant Euronymous Cornelius, a former chemist. On the spiritual side, there was Gaspert Bastiens, a clergyman known as a predicant in Dutch. He was travelling with his entire family. 
with the exception of only perhaps half a dozen people, uh, everybody slept commonly, uh, often in tiny spaces packed amongst guns or ropes. Um, in the case of most of the common soldiers and sailors, the gun deck where most of these people lived was only a few feet above the waterline and was constantly wet. The bilges didn't actually uh, exit into the sea, they exited onto the gun deck. So what you had was a situation where people below decks were often in the storm, unable to get out to the latrines. They would vomit into the bilges, they would defecate into the bilges, and all of this filth would then be brought up and would slop down the deck amongst the sleeping men, um, submerging them with sewage. By the time that the ship was around about the level of the equator, food would have been in the hold for perhaps two to three months. It would perhaps be beginning to rot if it hadn't been preserved properly. It would be laden with salt, and you have to eat it because it's the only food you're going to get. And of course it makes you extremely thirsty. The water in large barrels in the hold becomes alive with worms and weed and algae. You have to strain it between your teeth to get rid of all these living organisms in order to drink it. During the course of the voyage, you're going to be subjected to extreme boredom, extreme changes in climate. If the weather turned foul, it was virtually impossible to uh, get, go on deck. Even the, the richest people would have been alive with lice. And the hold uh, and the decks of the ship itself would also have been covered in vermin. There were a lot of rats on board. So it was really a very uncomfortable place to live, a very boring place to live, and the food, the water, the sustenance would have been dreadful by modern standards. After almost six months, the fleet finally reached the southern tip of Africa. During a stop at Table Bay, there was a heated exchange between Commander Pelsart and the skipper, Jacobs. This argument may have played a crucial part in what happened next. It's said in the journals that Jacobs became drunk and then uh, boarded some of the other ships of the convoy where he behaved himself with all very arguments. He uh, had drunken rows with people, he had a fight with somebody on board a warship. When Jacobs returned to the ship, Pelsat upbraided him and that uh, was allegedly the uh, inspiration for the mutiny. Um, Jacobs then said to Cornelius on deck as they left the Cape of Good Hope, if only he was a younger man, uh, he would do something about this great insult. Cornelius is then supposed to have replied, and what would that be? And that, of course, was where the Batavia mutiny uh, was supposed to have uh, originated. Shortly after leaving the Cape, the fleet ran into a violent storm, and some say deliberately, Skipper Jacobs lost contact with the other ships. From 1611, the VOC abandoned the northern route to Java, using instead a course driven by the roaring forties of the southern Indian Ocean. To prevent wrecking on the great southern land, now known as Australia, the ships would turn north and run parallel to its western coast. According to Commander Pelsart's journal, after almost seven months at sea, the Batavia was alive with subversive elements. One night, the mutinous resentment boiled over. Suddenly and brutally, the wife of a VOC undermerchant, Lucretia Yards, was assaulted. She was uh, grabbed uh, and smeared with, with excrement and, and filth. Unfortunately, Commander Pelsat was ill, probably with some form of tropical disease, and he failed to unearth the perpetrators. Tensions on board were reaching breaking point, but whatever mutinous plots were being hatched, fate was about to intervene. The night of the 3rd of June was clear and moonlit. Skipper Jacobs himself was on watch. Early in the morning, the account goes that the skipper thought he saw a reef ahead and he called to the lookout to say what's that ahead and the lookout said it's the moon on the water and it wasn't. In Pelsart's journal he said I was lying in my bunk feeling unwell when I heard the rudder hit the bottom and the ship came to a sudden halt, throwing me out of my bed so you can imagine a sort of you know a 600 ton vessel coming to a, a very quick um, halt like that it must be very violent. As dawn broke, the vessel started to fill with water. With no hope of saving it, 
180 people escaped the sinking vessel. I came here first in 1971. I've been coming back here to the Abrolhos ever since, and most of my career has been involved with Batavia in some way or another. We assume that the majority of the people went to Beacon Island, so they would have rowed in their boat from the wreck site over there, round past that reef there, down to Traitors Island, and that would have been uh, probably one of their first stops, because it's, but it's not a very big island, it's quite small, it would only have taken probably 50 people at the maximum. Their main objective, I think, would have been to go to Beacon Island. It's the biggest, it's the highest, it's the most sort of, um, most sensible place to go. The Batavia had run into one of the many reefs surrounding the Abrolhos Islands. Situated some 60 kilometres due west of the mainland, the Abrolhos were barren, windswept, inhospitable islands that were largely the domain of nesting seabirds. Among the first survivors to land on one of the islands was the clergyman, the predicant Geisbert Bastiens and his family. The tiny island was covered in sharp coral skeletons and had no fresh water at all. It was to become known as the Batavia's graveyard. The next day, Commander Pelsart and the skipper Jacobs approached the islands with supplies saved from the ship. They were worried about being taken hostage by the survivors and Jacobs persuaded Palsart that their only real hope was to go and try and find water. So off they go to the mainland to go and find water. They sail along the mainland trying to find water. In this particular part of the mainland there isn't water and they went so far north that they then decided to make a run for Batavia and try and get help there. For the castaways left behind on the islands, food was not their immediate concern. The waters surrounding the islands were rich with marine life. And there was an abundant supply of seabird eggs. It was the lack of fresh water that was most critical. Increasingly desperate, some took to drinking seawater in even Europe. In those first critical days, ten were to die of thirst. Abandoned by their leaders and stranded on a desert island, thousands of kilometers from any known civilization, the predicant Bastiens and the other survivors probably thought their situation couldn't get any worse. In fact, their nightmare was only just beginning. The under-merchant Geronimus Cornelius was the most senior person left, but he was still on board the ship, and the ship was beginning to break up. Forty people had already drowned crossing from the ship to the islands, uh, and he waited to the very last moment before abandoning the ship. For two days, he clung to a spar, uh, before he was washed up onto the island where the other survivors were. Once he recovered, he began to exert his authority. There was a very critical move of, of moving Webby Hayes and the soldiers off this island. They were disarmed and they were sent to search for water. With the soldiers gone, Cornelius and the band of supporters took complete control. Those not considered useful, typically the women and children and the sick or weak, started to disappear. The more attractive women, Cornelius spared to act as sexual slaves for his henchmen and he reserved Lucretia for himself. As items from the wreck began to wash ashore, Amongst them were some of Pelsart's fine clothing. These trappings helped reinforce Cornelius's growing megalomania. 
he decided to eliminate all opposition to his little empire. The slaughter of women, children, the weak and sick was accelerated. Eventually, over 120 would be ruthlessly murdered. Until now, virtually nothing has been known about Cornelius. We knew that he was an apothecary and that he had a store in Harlem itself. We now know from these documents, at the end of 1627, Cornelius's son died only three months after his birth. And he didn't die of any normal illness. Uh, he actually died of syphilis. This syphilis apparently was contracted from the wet nurse who Cornelius himself hired. Um, but at this time, of course, for an apothecary to be associated with such uh, an incurable venereal disease was a terrible disgrace. His business collapsed as a result. And so uh, within that 12-month period, he goes from being a very successful, perhaps prosperous member of the upper middle classes to being bankrupt, a man who has no reputation who, and, and who has no option but to take that extremely hazardous course of sailing for the, for the Indies, a place from which only one in three of all the Dutch people who left ever returned. In Pelsart's journal lies another clue to Cornelius' alleged mania. He was accused of being a follower of the controversial painter Terentius, who preached a sensualist philosophy which scandalized 17th century Dutch society. Terentius believed it was against the will of God for religions to restrict pleasure. While Cornelius denied any association, there is new evidence that points to a close connection. One of the most significant finds has actually been the document where he effectively declared his own bankruptcy, uh, which is witnessed by two men who we know were friends of Terentius. And for those men to sign a document of that sort of import suggests that they were very close to Cornelius. We know also that they were close to Terentius, and that is the best evidence that we have that Cornelius and Terentius knew each other and perhaps that uh, Cornelius was influenced by Terentius's views. Cornelius believed his actions were inspired by God and could not be evil. Shipwrecked on a desert island half a world away, it was a license, literally, to get away with murder. We have a man like Geronimus who quite possibly, from a clinical perspective, was a, a psychopath. If the idea fits into his mind that it would be wise to kill 120 people to ensure that food supplies don't run out, that seems to be not only justifiable but actually ordained in a very real sense to him by God. On the night of the 21st of July, Cornelius's reign of terror reached new heights. He invited the predicant Bastiens and his eldest daughter Judic to dinner with one of his henchmen. While they ate, the rest of the clergyman's family, his wife and six other children, were brutally butchered and their bodies thrown into a hastily dug pit. Over 360 years later, a cray fisherman uncovered the first signs of a mass grave. For maritime archaeologists, the immediate concern was a major archaeological site had been disturbed. Obviously the first thing that we needed to do was to find out what the site was and an excavation became a priority. And once we started this process, of course, the big question was, was the grave in fact the family of the predicant that was killed during the massacres? Is this um, the predicant's family or some other similar kind of incident, maybe earlier on in the piece, where people were sick and they just killed them or maybe they just died and they dug a pit and, um, and buried them that way. At the Western Australian Maritime Museum in Fremantle, the excavated skeletons are carefully reconstructed by archaeologist Juliet Pasphia. She is keen to test the theory these are the remains of the predicant's family. As you can see the pit is circular and um, there was the, the young child pushed against um, this person's back in the same sort of flex position like this one who was laid on top and the three individuals here, the two adults and a child. So the fact that we've got children does make it possible that we're dealing with the predicant's family. We found on the left shin bone of this, uh, this man in his early 20s um, some strange bony outgrowth in this area here just below the knee and 
it looks a little bit as if it is a reaction of the bone to a chronic inflammation. One of the adult skeletons got a pathology on the knee. Right. On the, uh, with one of the bones offering a vital clue, Juliet consults a database with descriptions of victims. Can you maybe try something a bit more specific like um, limping? Limping, now I can try. Uh, ah. The investigation points to the identity of victims other than the predicant's family. He's a carpenter. Yeah. Can you look at um, other people being killed on the 12th? He was the gunner. But with only five skeletons to examine, Juliet's investigation proves inconclusive. She is not convinced they have uncovered all the possible victims in the pit. The reason? a still unexplained feature. In the middle of all the skeletal material we found uh, a, a very dense, a very dark brown coloured um, deposit and at first we had no idea what it was and, and to be honest it's still a bit of a mystery. It's very dense, it looks a bit like, like mud cake when you excavate it and that's a very big contrast um, compared to the um, surrounding yellow, yellow loose sand. Juliet and a maritime museum team have returned to the Abrolhos Islands to recover the mysterious dark mass, which has become known, somewhat affectionately, as the blob. We're still not quite sure what it is, but once we've, we've lifted it, we will bring it back to Fremantle and to be able to excavate it in the lab in controlled circumstances. And um, we hope that we might find still some bones inside the material that um, we're not quite sure about the preservation of that so it's it's good to do that in a controlled environment. That's not one of the, one of the points. As part of the current investigation the maritime archaeologists want to discover how the Batavia victims actually died and have asked a police forensic scientist to analyse the skeletons. So far, um, the descriptions of the way that the people were killed and the types of implements that were used have been fairly consistent with what has come out of the journals. This particular person was a male you can see here on the apex of the skull uh, that there is this what we would call in forensic terms sharp force trauma and it appears to have been caused by uh, a sharp bladed instrument. What we can tell from this particular wound is that uh, the individual was probably facing the assailant at the time of the attack and the assailant was probably a right hander. This individual was found in the, uh, the pit excavation. One of the central incisors has been driven back into the region of the upper jaw. And this is uh, typical of the types of injuries you see in um, brawling incidents in modern forensic work. The rest of the individuals um, had little evidence of trauma or cut marks, some of them having absolutely no um, visible wounds at all. Um, of course, these individuals may have been dispatched um, by manner of a cutthroat or, be drown or having been drowned. So we had a variety of scenarios here of how these people were being killed. There's a reference to a morning star being used. There's references to people being decapitated, um, being run through with a pike, drowned. I mean, I think you've pretty got much got almost every conceivable way that you know a person could have, could could have been done in them. Um, all sorts of you know any method that was available really. The next step in the investigation involves a CAT scan, which converts the physical remains to virtual computer data. The skull can now be looked at and analysed in three dimensions. Yeah, it's interesting that the force of the blow hasn't separated any of the sutures either. OK, if we want to just tilt it yep. uh, a little bit forward now, we'll have a look Bring at that. Yeah, that's good. That's nice. With a deep groove on the top of the skull, 
It was originally thought the cause of death of this victim was from a cutlass blow. Can you do a section here across that cut? Find that point. Find that cut, yeah. The forensic science team uses the scan to test this hypothesis, and the results are surprising. Not as deep as you thought, actually. No, it's not, interestingly. Uh, certainly not as um, extensive as I first thought, and certainly would not have been enough to cause the death of the individual. On the trail of other clues in the Netherlands, maritime archaeologist Robert Parthesius has tracked down a direct descendant of the predicant, Bastiens. I know the stories, I know the families. So, for me, it, it is uh, important. Mrs. Bastiens is shown pictures of the victims who may be her relatives. Yeah. But the youngest was Roland. Yes. And he was uh, uh, yeah, six, six years, six six years, years old, yeah. I think. For, for me, it's uh, very hard to, to realize that it is my family. And, uh, yeah, it's sad. With Mrs. Bastien's directly descended from the Batavia's predicant down the male line, vital DNA comparisons with the bodies in the pit are not possible. She is, however, concerned about what is done with the remains. But what to do with the skeletons? Must he bury it again? Must he uh, cremate it? I don't know. And maybe I can have a little bone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know. The, the finger or so. What, do that, what does that mean for you? Yeah, t take it with me. Take it with me. Because it's my ancestor. I respect him. For four months of the year, the Abrolhos Islands are home to a small community of crayfishing families. The rest of the year, they are deserted, just as they might have been in 1629. As the dig continues, the maritime archaeologists decide to use a ground-penetrating radar. Evidence of ground disturbance could indicate encampments or graves. The work will be no easy task. <coughs> Due to centuries of burrowing nesting seabirds, the soil is soft and treacherous underfoot. Interpreting ground penetrating radar is quite complicated. What we're trying to find is whether there's pits in this area. Well, we've got this fairly significant anomaly or feature. This one here that's, uh, where are we there, about half a metre, 600 yeah. mil below. Once we get going, in this area we've got another one here. Yeah. And again, they're about that 500, 600 mil below. Results look interesting. We're finding that there are anomalies. We have to do archaeological work to determine what those anomalies are. With temperatures rising to over 30 degrees centigrade, the mysterious blob has to be kept damp to avoid it drying out and cracking. But it's not just the blob that might contain vital clues. Every fragment of material excavated around it must be carefully recorded and scrutinised. Whenever we come back to the islands, even for land excavations, we'll always try and get out to the Batavia site to have a look and see what condition it's in. In the early 1970s, Jeremy Green led a major expedition to survey and excavate the wreck site. What you see today, if you swim over it, is not actually much different from what it was like when we first saw it. So we've left the cannon, we've left the anchors. The team was interested to track the underwater movement of artefacts from the wreck, and dummy artefacts were placed on the site. 
To check on the experiment's progress, Jeremy and the team visit an area on the other side of the reef. You've got the ship on the reef, the wind blows in this direction and basically everything heads that way. So, I mean, all the um, barrels and the wood and the bits of sail, I mean, this place would have been like a huge dump, you know, sort of gradually as the ship disintegrated. We're trying to find out how fast these uh, artefacts come over the top of the reef, what sort of conditions it is and how far they travel. While this find is part of the experiment, other items found are those from the actual shipwreck. Yeah, what a lot of stuff. That's that's a cost jar. Yeah. That's quite unusual for the side. This chemist's jar could have belonged to Cornelius himself. What we've been finding today, all the bits and pieces that got washed over and got broken in the process, the ceramics, um, bricks, little bits of bellum in jug, things that, that survive well in the waters. A critical moment has arrived. On a pedestal of sand, the blob is ready for removal. At an estimated 200 kilos, great care must be taken to ensure the mass remains complete. I think everybody will be sitting here holding their breath for the rest of the afternoon. It's an anxious time. The slightest mistake could damage this important find. Okay. Oh, it's okay, it's okay. My goal is together. Carefully packed in foam, the blob will now travel over 500 kilometres by boat and road to the Maritime Museum in Fremantle for further excavation. At the site, the investigation continues with the search for small artefacts, bone fragments and other clues. With a vast quantity of material to sift through, the team must remain totally focused. Even the smallest piece of evidence could be crucial. With the blob safely on its way, Jeremy takes land archaeologist Alistair Patterson to another site from the extraordinary Batavia story. This is West Wallaby Island. Here, an opposition force to Cornelius's reign of terror was established. The soldiers Cornelius had sent to look for water were led by a resourceful mercenary called Webby Hayes. When Hayes and his men found fresh water on West Wallaby, they sent a smoke signal to the other survivors. Hoping they would have died searching, Cornelius did not respond. Hayes and his men managed to live off the land, feeding themselves with birds' eggs and slow-moving snakes. They also caught and ate tamar wallabies, a sort of um, small kangaroo. In the process, the wallabies became the first Australian marsupials to be described by Europeans. Perhaps even more significantly, the soldiers also constructed stone shelters. You can see how difficult it is to see it with covered up by the bushes like this. Whether it was whether the bush, the vegetation was this high in the 17th century or not, you know, don't really know. But uh, well, whether the structure was as high as well, I guess. Yeah. You see, it's two two chamber, two rooms. Okay. Um,
I guess there's a bit riding on it. I mean, if, if this is Webby Hayes' hut, that would make it yeah. the earliest European structure in Australia. Yes, but it's quite clear that this is Dutch. They would have had water barrels, they would have had containers, that sort of thing. And this is exactly the sort of things that we mm. found. Barrel hoops, um, ceramic jar fragments, um, that sort of thing. Eventually, some escaped from Cornelius's reign of terror and warned Hayes of the terrible carnage. On the 27th of July, Hayes and his men were attacked. But they were ready. With improvised weapons and stones, they drove off their attackers. Meanwhile, after four weeks at sea, Skipper Jacobs had achieved a remarkable feat of seamanship. With Commander Pelsart, he had reached Java. On reaching the Batavia Citadel, Pelsart had an immediate audience with the Governor General, Jan Peterson Cohen. Pelsart would have been terrified. He had lost his ship and a large quantity of company valuables, and Cohen had a reputation for being merciless. He already had had Jacobs arrested for wrecking the ship. Pelsart, however, was lucky. A VOC motto was Jesus is good, but trade is better. And the company needed him to find the wreck to recover its fortune. He was given the ship Sardam and ordered back to the Abronis Islands. But without the expertise of jailed skipper Jacobs, Pelsart spent crucial weeks searching for the wreck site. On the 1st of September, Cornelius sent the much-abused predicant, Bastiens, to try and trick Webby Hayes. But with the predicant describing the gruesome events he had witnessed, Hayes was not deceived. The next day, relying on his powers of persuasion and senior rank, Cornelius met with Hayes in person. It was a serious miscalculation. Without warning, Hayes took the outraged undermerchant prisoner. For more than two weeks, Cornelius was held prisoner. Then, in an attempt to free him, his men attacked. Incredibly, just as the battle got underway, the Sardam was sighted. Hoping to get to the ship first and seize it, the mutineers fled the scene. But it was Hayes who got to Pelsart first, and the mutineers were quickly rounded up. Pelsart set about recovering the fortune that, that was on board the Batavia, and he also supervised the, um, the period of what was euphemistically known as the examinations. Dutch law required a confession, and these were extracted in this case by water torture. That was standard 17th century practice that if you know that pe it was part of the, a legal procedure barbaric as it may seem that a person was um, tortured Cornelius's fate was decided on the spot these are summaries of the main sentences which were um, given later and you can see in his journal Pilsart recorded Cornelius's condemnation the sentence says that he shall be taken to a place of security, uh, he'll then be taken to the gallows and prior to being executed he'll have uh, both his hands amputated, um, all of his goods confiscated uh, and all the wages that are outstanding to him uh, will be taken uh, back for the benefit of the company and he will then be hanged until he's dead. Uh, uh, not possible to go to Seals Islands so and bring the evil doers to death according to the census. Oh. Jeremy and assistant museum curator Kareli Souter plan a survey of one of the islands, reputedly the scene of the executions. Gallows. So you'd actually head out this way. is up our first 100 metre baseline we came across this which is a lead moulded object from these holes we can imagine nails sticking out so it's a spiked object what is known as a morning star which would have 
perhaps a rope or a bit of chain stuck through that which you would sort of swing around and then strike someone over the head. It's quite a deadly instrument on its own with the weight of it and the nails would have actually finished someone off. There's one reference to it in uh, Pelsat's journal, a fellow being beaten around the head with it. Uh, and it is possible that this was used to in the murders we know took, that took place on Long Island. For two weeks, Cornelius and his men were subjected to trial and torture. On the 2nd of October, 1629, he and seven others faced the awful justice of the times. The people who, who were taken out and sentenced here, um, they, were, they were taken to Seals Island, which we think is Long Island. Cornelius had both hands chopped off and he was then hung. The other mutineers that were, were, were executed had one hand chopped off and were, um, and were hung. Cornelius claimed his innocence right up to the very end and uh, just before he died he stated that he hoped to obtain justice in heaven because he felt that he didn't get it on earth. Two of the mutineers Pelsart spared, ordering them to be marooned on the unknown mainland. Others were not so lucky. When they reached Batavia, they were retried, tortured and executed. But the curse of the Batavia continued. The skipper of the Sardam drowned trying to recover the company's valuables. Lucretia arrived at the Batavia settlement only to hear her husband had just died. The following year, Pelsart, a broken man, also died. While the predicant, Bastiennes, remarried in 1631, only to succumb to dysentery two years later. And the Batavia's skipper, Jacobs, was last heard of, rotting in jail and facing likely death. There are little bits of bone, yeah, it's not in a very good condition. But it's At the sifting operation, baby's teeth are being discovered, revealing a new victim. Oh, we might have a, another um, individual in the grave. Really? Yeah. Is this from the, this is from the profile? No, this comes from underneath the lump. Oh, does it really? We just keep pulling out teeth, baby teeth. Was the five-year-old, did that have teeth? Yeah, it had, well, we've made a, a bit of a comparison. This is what I got from the database, what we have in the museum of yeah. the five-year-old. And we're getting teeth that, you know, are already present Another in there. Another set. Yeah, and it looks like they might be younger. This go, clearly it. looks like um, I've lost my bottle of wine, doesn't it? it not yet. Not yet. Not yet. Right. Not yet. I don't think the Predicans family we've got a, we've got had such young bottle children. Of wine that, uh, that I bet it was in the beginning that it was Predicans family and Julia Penna. Well, I don't think the Predicans family did have they children have this young. No. no. So, what kind of wine do you like? But it's true. It's still <laughs> true that I know that Mica Cadus was a female passenger on board. She was killed on the same night, mm. and the day before, her suckling child has been killed. Oh. So there we go again. The only problem is still we've got only, well, we've got six individuals now, yeah. but um, the, the graves should contain at least nine. The pit is in one of the crayfishing family's backyards and must be returned to its previous condition before the fishermen arrive for the coming season. The x-rays will just give us an indication of how far the material we're seeing on the outside actually extends into the matrix itself. We found the teeth underneath it, so it may be that there's other material related to that body within it, and we may also pick up things like metal or any fabric or something in it with the x-ray, which would be great to know before we start. Back at the Maritime Museum, archaeologist Alistair Patterson takes charge of the blobs excavation. So, the first one, we have what I believe is a row of buttons. Absolutely. And there's another two down here. Fantastic. 
Oh, and look at that. Yeah, yeah, even the loop there. Yeah. It's the uh, oh, high that. ones. They're the same. Their buttons. The X-rays reveal the blob does indeed contain artifacts. Two rows of buttons are clearly visible. While other features are less defined, there could well be more bones. That's amazing. It's a very small area and there's not much in here. With the plan being to excavate the blob completely, great care must be taken not to miss or damage artifacts or bones. That's a good place to start. The great thing about a thing like this, it's like unwrapping a Christmas present. Slowly, very slowly. Everything has to be recorded along the way. So in that sense, I guess it seems patient. Um, that's nice, it's delaying the pleasure, if you like. So it finishes what was started with the excavation of these graves. And I think there is a potential that we'll find out things which relate to the people who were on that island, the people who were put in that grave, and the conditions under which they were buried. As a forensic dentist, Dr. Stephen Knott is able to work out the age of the child's teeth found in the pit. This will then be checked against the database from Pelsart's journal. I was able to estimate that this person would have been approximately eight months old, plus or minus a month. We have to also think of the possibility that there might be another group buried on Beacon Island, which is the group of people that died in the first week, right straight after the, the, the ship wrecked. At the University of Western Australia, a powerful electron microscope may provide new clues. It's, it's the tooth, the biting surface. So what we're looking at is the area... Due to the environment of the Abrolhos Islands, those who survived any length of time would almost certainly have consumed food with grit or sand particles, causing minor but identifiable scratches on their teeth. Yeah, no, this, this will be a challenge. And you'd rather we didn't cut it in half, I take it. No, if I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> this one here is very smooth as we talk. If scratches are found, the victims are unlikely to have died early on. With the Predicant's family not murdered until seven weeks after they were shipwrecked, scratches will lend more weight to the Predicant's family theory. I've labelled that juvenile upper. If you look in this area here, and we come to the main vacation, so this is a hundred times. Look at that, that's huge. The results revive the possibility that the Predicant's family has been found after all. That may well prove you're a... Mm, I hope so. Give you the yeah. evidence. At the blob, finally the buttons begin to surface. But the clear outline revealed by the X-rays is obscured by a thick coating of concretion. Meanwhile, Dr. Knott is meticulously assembling fragments of the pit victim's skulls. His objective is to use modern techniques to put a face on the ancient remains. First, the skulls are scanned. Then, a laser uses the data to build replicas of the originals out of resin. is used to recreate the missing sections of the skulls. The next step is to create a mold of the resin skull. From this, plaster copies are made. Flesh and skin depths are calculated from the skull's bone structure and standardized measurements of Caucasian features. I'm just wondering whether it wouldn't be a bad idea to leave a 
perhaps a proportion of this unexcavated. And At the Maritime Museum, the archaeologists are having second thoughts about completely excavating the blob. I, I think well, when you're dealing with a unique, essentially a unique object, then I think it would be worthwhile leaving some behind. So I think it's a good idea. It's a matter of figuring out... We have one major mystery that still remains. Just how old is the blob and what is it? Does it date from 1629 or is it something more recent? To try and solve this, we've sent samples to the Centre for Isotope Research in Groningen in the Netherlands. So carbon dating tests will try to determine its age. Atoms from the blob sample are converted to fast-moving ions and accelerated at enormous speeds in a powerful accelerator mass spectrometer. Giant magnets then capture ions, which have the essential information for dating. Meanwhile, back in Australia, the faces from 1629 are starting to be revealed. Good, I think it's fabulous. Hi. Oh my goodness. The reconstructions put a human face on the terrible Batavia tragedy. And there's news of the tests done in the Netherlands. These are the carbon dates that we took from within the blob on the, the black material. Oh, yeah. They're not on the bone or anything like that. It's just the, the matrix of the blob. Mm. And they would all indicate a post-1950 deposition. 1950? Yes. So the blob itself? The blob itself, as a form, has originated in the recent past. Oh, right. The information on the blob is unexpected, as are results from a new study on the skeletons from the pit. It's, it's not going to be the, the Predicants family in that grave. On what evidence? Um, well, the age profile of the, of the seven individuals, and also the um, uh, research into the form of the actual skeletons as well. They're, they've lived lives which wouldn't indicate... A, uh, the kind of lives that the Predicant family may have lived. Yeah. Yeah. I think I lose my bottle of wine. I bet with um, Juliet that it was. Pre I, I thought it was the Predicant's family to start off with. I suppose the interesting thing is that it, the whole of this project raises more questions than it sort of answers. I mean, that's the fascinating thing about it. It's not the Predicant's family. Who is it? And what is the story of the blob and that whole business? I mean, lots of new and interesting things, lots of new questions, which is exactly what you expect from archaeology. Meanwhile, back on the Abrolhos Islands, countless other graves remain undiscovered. Amongst them, the Predicant's family. The mystery of who lies buried here will remain for future generations to solve. of the world lie countless shipwrecks, 
time capsules waiting to be discovered and explored. Investigating a story of mutiny, murder and madness, a team of maritime archaeologists are in search of Batavia's bones. Off the west coast of Australia, these are the remote and treacherous reefs of the Abrolhos Islands. Today, the scene of an extraordinary investigation into one of the world's most brutal mass murders. The victims from a shipwreck that took place nearly 400 years ago. Of all the dramas of the sea, the story of the Batavia is probably one of the most dramatic. The number of people who were killed, the way in which the mutiny evolved, the survivors stuck on a tiny coral island with no cover, nowhere to hide, for weeks and weeks on end with a, a gang of bloodthirsty thugs who were as likely to kill you as look at you. And really, although this was pretty much the first page in the history of Australia, it's all, even now it's also the bloodiest. You've got mutinies, you've got people with their hands chopped off, you've got people that, are, that obviously died in very, um, um, very dramatic circumstances. The investigation into the gruesome story of the Batavia spans the globe. In the Abrolhos Islands, Jeremy Green of the Western Australian Maritime Museum is unearthing evidence of brutal murder. While in the Netherlands, historian and author Mike Dash is searching archives for clues to a remarkable story which begins in Amsterdam in the year 1628. It was a time of religious, political and social upheaval. The Netherlands was embroiled in the ongoing conflict of the Reformation and anti-papist movements. To the early 17th century Dutch, trade was all important, in particular with the Spice Islands of the Far East. The company that had come to embody maritime and merchant power was the United East India Company, or BOC. In 1628, the VOC launched a major new ship. It was the pride of the fleet and was called the Tavia, named after the company's prized possession, a major trading settlement in Java, better known today as Jakarta in Indonesia. In late October 1628, the Batavia set sail from Amsterdam with a fleet of company ships and began the long and hazardous journey to the East Indies. In the Dutch archives, historian Mike Dash examines a crucial document, a journal compiled by the Batavia's commander, Francisco Pelsart. Pelsart's journals, which are the main source, have been published in both English and Dutch, um, and they're really quite a detailed source. They run to well over 50 pages of print. At this time, um, Dutch East Indiamen were, in many respects, the most complex machines that had ever been built, certainly in Western Europe. They were the pinnacle of um, contemporary technology, the equivalent of spacecraft today. But at the same time, they were really highly uncomfortable vessels on which to make a very long voyage. And they would sail at a maximum of about four miles an hour and a normal speed of two and a half miles an hour. So you were effectively travelling at less than walking pace for a period of between six and nine months. On board the Batavia were well over 300 souls. A mix of sailors, soldiers, VOC company officials and a number of passengers. The Batavia was a retour ship, uh, a ship that the uh, Dutch East India Company called uh, vessels that were going backwards and forwards from the Netherlands to Batavia. She carried a fortune in coins contained in 12 chests, worth over $30 million in today's money. Commander Pelsart was a veteran of nine years in the East Indies. He'd had a bad relationship with the skipper, Arian Jacobs. They'd fallen out on their voyage back in 1627. Third in command was under merchant Euronymous Cornelius, a former chemist. On the spiritual side, there was Gaspert Bastiens, a clergyman known as a predicant in Dutch. He was travelling with his entire family. 
with the exception of only perhaps half a dozen people, uh, everybody slept commonly, uh, often in tiny spaces packed amongst guns or ropes. Um, in the case of most of the common soldiers and sailors, the gun deck where most of these people lived was only a few feet above the waterline and was constantly wet. The bilges didn't actually uh, exit into the sea, they exited onto the gun deck. So what you had was a situation where people below decks were often in a storm, unable to get out to the latrines. They would vomit into the bilges, they would defecate into the bilges, and all of this filth would then be brought up and would slop down the deck amongst the sleeping men, um, submerging them with sewage. By the time that the ship was around about the level of the equator, food would have been in the hold for perhaps two to three months. It would perhaps be in to rot if it hadn't been preserved properly. It would be laden with salt, and you have to eat it because it's the only food you're going to get. And of course it makes you extremely thirsty. The water in large barrels in the hold becomes alive with worms and weed and algae. You have to strain it between your teeth to get rid of all these living organisms in order to drink it. During the course of the voyage, you are going to be subjected to extreme boredom, extreme changes in climate. If the weather turned foul, it was virtually impossible to uh, get, go on deck. Even the, the richest people would have been alive with lice, and the hold uh, and the decks of the ship itself would also have been covered in vermin. There were a lot of rats on board. So it was really a very uncomfortable place to live, a very boring place to live, and the food the water, the sustenance would have been dreadful by modern standards. After almost six months, the fleet finally reached the southern tip of Africa. During a stop at Table Bay, there was a heated exchange between Commander Pelsart and the skipper, Jacobs. This argument may have played a crucial part in what happened next. It's said in the journals that Jacobs became drunk and then uh, boarded some of the other ships of the convoy where he behaved himself with all very arguments. He uh, had drunken rows with people, he had a fight with somebody on board a warship. When Jacobs returned to the ship, Pelsat upbraided him and that uh, was allegedly the uh, inspiration for the mutiny. Um, Jacobs then said to Cornelius on deck as they left the Cape of Good Hope that if only he was a younger man, uh, he would do something about this great insult. Cornelius is then supposed to have replied, and what would that be? And that, of course, was where the Batavia mutiny uh, was supposed to have uh, originated. Shortly after leaving the Cape, the fleet ran into a violent storm, and some say deliberately, Skipper Jacobs lost contact with the other ships. From 1611, the VOC abandoned the northern route to Java, using instead a course driven by the roaring forties of the southern Indian Ocean. To prevent wrecking on the great southern land, now known as Australia, the ships would turn north and run parallel to its western coast. According to Commander Pelsart's journal, after almost seven months at sea, the Batavia was alive with subversive elements. One night, the mutinous resentment boiled over. Suddenly and brutally, the wife of a VOC undermerchant, Lucretia Yards, was assaulted. She was uh, grabbed uh, and smeared with, with excrement and, and filth. Unfortunately, Commander Pelsat was ill, probably with some form of tropical disease, and he failed to unearth the perpetrators. Tensions on board were reaching breaking point. But whatever mutinous plots were being hatched, fate was about to intervene. The night of the 3rd of June was clear and moonlit. Skipper Jacobs himself was on watch. Early in the morning, the account goes that the skipper thought he saw a reef ahead and he called to the lookout to say what's that ahead and the lookout said it's the moon on the water and it wasn't. In Pelsart's journal he said I was lying in my bunk feeling unwell when I heard the rudder hit the bottom and the ship came to a sudden halt, throwing me out of my bed so you can imagine a sort of you know a 600 tonne vessel coming to a, a very quick um, halt like that it must be very violent. As dawn broke, the vessel started to fill with water. With no hope of saving it, 
180 people escaped the sinking vessel. I came here first in 1971. I've been coming back here to the Abrolhos ever since, and most of my career has been involved with Batavia in some way or another. We assume that the majority of the people went to Beacon Island, so they would have rowed in their boat from the wreck site over there, round past that reef there, down to Traitors Island, and that would have been uh, probably one of their first stops. Because it's, but it's not a very big island. It's quite small. It would only have taken probably 50 people at the maximum. Their main objective, I think, would have been to go to Beacon Island. It's the biggest. It's the highest. It's the most sort of um, most sensible place to go. The Batavia had run into one of the many reefs surrounding the Abrolhos Islands. Situated some 60 kilometres due west of the mainland, the Abrolhos were barren, windswept, inhospitable islands that were largely the domain of nesting seabirds. Among the first survivors to land on one of the islands was the clergyman, the predicant Geisbert Bastiens and his family. The tiny island was covered in sharp coral skeletons and had no fresh water at all. It was to become known as the Batavia's graveyard. The next day, Commander Pelsart and the skipper Jacobs approached the islands with supplies saved from the ship. They were worried about being taken hostage by the survivors and Jacobs persuaded Palsart that their only real hope was to go and try and find water. So off they go to the mainland to go and find water. They sail along the mainland trying to find water. In this particular part of the mainland there isn't water and they went so far north that they then decided to make a run for Batavia and try and get help there. For the castaways left behind on the islands, food was not their immediate concern. The waters surrounding the islands were rich with marine life. And there was an abundant supply of seabird eggs. It was the lack of fresh water that was most critical. Increasingly desperate, some took to drinking seawater in even Europe. In those first critical days, ten were to die of thirst. Abandoned by their leaders and stranded on a desert island, thousands of kilometers from any known civilization, the predicant Bastiens and the other survivors probably thought their situation couldn't get any worse. In fact, their nightmare was only just beginning. The under-merchant Geronimus Cornelius was the most senior person left, but he was still on board the ship, and the ship was beginning to break up. Forty people had already drowned crossing from the ship to the islands, uh, and he waited to the very last moment before abandoning the ship. For two days, he clung to a spar, uh, before he was washed up onto the island where the other survivors were. Once he recovered, he began to exert his authority. There was a very critical move of, of moving Webby Hayes and the soldiers off this island. They were disarmed and they were sent to search for water. With the soldiers gone, Cornelius and the band of supporters took complete control. Those not considered useful, typically the women and children and the sick or weak, started to disappear. The more attractive women, Cornelius spared to act as sexual slaves for his henchmen, and he was 